ahead and take your booklets and open them up. We are looking at White Flag, a the power of a surrendered life. And this week specifically, the title will be on the screen. We're looking at the area of community. So if you could open up your booklets and you'll see the title community there. Um, and we'll jump right into this today. I'm actually going to take, if, I, if you allow me, a little extra time this week because I'm actually giving you a break. So it was going to be two sermons. I'm putting two in one. So give me a little bit of breathing room as we walk through this. And then it's one week shorter for you and go, oh, yeah, we can do that. That's good. Do I have to mean I don't have to come to church one extra week? No, no, no. That, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. But we're going to walk through this together. Uh, please get a pen so you can fill in some of the blanks. You notice there's some lines in your booklet where you'll be able to fill in as we go. And on the screen, it'll be quite simple. You'll see those words in bright red so you'll, you won't miss what word we're talking about. Again, Nehemiah chapter 12 is where we'll end up. But let me uh, give you a little preamble to this whole series. I, uh, this is the new and improved White Flag series. Uh, let me just explain what I mean by that. If you notice in the front cover, we have the older Bethany logo on there. We printed these in 2020 because we thought we were going to do that series. And how people know COVID had a different idea for us. And so we really wanted the church to gather, to experience worship together to be in one place. So we've delayed it a few times and the staff are looking at me, we're going to do it now and go, we're going for it. So here we are in 2022, finally at this place. But I believe with all my heart that our church is poised for great renewal. I believe that God is bringing renewal to the entire church worldwide. There's great things happening all across the planet. Don't look at the news, the negative news of what may be a scandal or a failure here and there by a celebrity pastor. Do not let that distract you from the fact that Jesus is building his church and it's a glorious church and it's a wonderful church and he's doing amazing things across the planet. Just look at Africa, look at Asia, look at South America and there's revival fires burning around the world for the glory of God. We are at the precipice, I believe, in even North America. It's really dry in North America, right? It's really negative in North America, but you know what? Fires burn brighter when you've got dry kindling, and I believe North America is poised for one spark, and whew, we're going to be ablaze with the glory of God. So trust me on that. Revival is coming. How many people want revival to sweep our land? Coast to coast to coast, this is our desire. This is our prayer. But let me just explain to you, revival isn't about raw, raw, raw. It's about laying down our lives. It's about our yieldedness to the lordship of Jesus. It's about Jesus having first place, him being exalted as king of kings and lord of lords. And God is returning the church to the power of the cross, the power of the blood. And if you want to know what revival looks like, it's a transformed people. And I'll tell you, it's about the church embracing surrender in its greatest ways. Faith doesn't come from striving. We all know this. Faith comes from surrender. And the opening thought I have in our goal in this entire series is that we will recognize and summarize in this one great idea, I believe, that I'm going to show you in Scripture and propose to you that real worship is surrendered obedience. So when we talk about community, what does that mean? We're going to surrender our will over God's will for our community together. It, doing this, God wants you to know that he loves you immensely and he's desiring of people that love him in return. So today, specific, we're, gonna, we're about to discover that worship is about a community surrendered to the lordship of Jesus. Father, I pray in this moment, in these next few minutes together, that you would speak to every heart gathered online together. We see this in your name. Amen. Amen. Now, the way that God accomplishes all these great ideas that I've just shared with you and how he fulfills his work in the world that we live in, in 2022, it's going to come through a people who are sacrificial, who are self-giving, who are surrendered, and we are Jesus' people, are we not? Is my mic on? <laughs> come on. We are Jesus' people, are we not? Yeah. That wasn't a rhetorical question. Number one, community. We're going to look at Nehemiah 12, verse 27 to 47. So bear with me. There's a lot of scripture here. Dedication at the wall of Jerusalem. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate 
joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals and harps and lyres. The singers were also brought together from the region around Jerusalem, from the villages of the Nephthalites, from Beth Gilgal, and from the area of Jeba and Asmarath. I'm already messing these words. Just forgive me. I'll just give a close guess on everyone, all right? For the singers had built villages for themselves around Jerusalem. Isn't that amazing? The singers couldn't wait to be close to the temple. Ooh, it's wonderful. Verse 30, when the priests and Levites had purified themselves ceremonially, they purified the people and the gates and the wall. I had the leaders of Judah go up on top of the wall. I also assigned two large choirs to give thanks. How we settle for a half a choir even? Two large choirs to give thanks. One was to proceed on top of the wall to the right, the ward of the dung gate. I'm not sure about that assignment, but anyways. Hosiah and half the leaders of Judah followed them. Some of you think sometimes music is, you know, represented by that point there. So I'm thinking that's why it's in scripture. All right. 32. Hoshia, half the leaders of Judah followed them, along with Azara, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemaiah, Jeremiah, as well as some of the priests with trumpets, and also Zechariah, son of Jonathan, son of Shemiah, son of Mattaiah, son of Micah. Son, am I going to read all of them? You're right, I am. I'm telling you, every one of these names has meaning and purpose. They're all lives lived in obedience and surrendered obedience to the will and purposes of God. I'm reading their names. Come on, church, this is good. How many people ever named their kids some of these, though? Looking at, ooh, no, maybe not. <laughs> Metaniah, son of Machai, son of Zakur, son of Asaph, and his associates, Shemiah, Azrael, Melali, Galali, Maya, and Nathaniel. Ooh, good, a normal one in between there. Judah and Hananiah with musical instruments prescribed by David, the man of God. Ezra, the scribe, led the procession. At the fountain gate, they continued directly up the steps of the city of David on the ascent to the wall and passed above the house of David and to the water gate on the east. The second choir proceeded in the opposite direction. I followed them on top of the wall together with half the people, past the tower of the ovens to the, brood, sorry, the broad wall, over the gate of Ephraim and Jeshanah gate and the fish gate and the tower of Hanau and the tower of Hundred. As far as the sheep gate, at the gate of the guard, they stopped. The two choirs then gave thanks, then took their places in the house of God. So did I, together with half the officials, as well as the priests, Eliam, Messiah, Maniah, Micaiah, Eliam, Zechariah, Hananiah, with their trumpets, and also Messiah, Shammai, Elazar, Uzi, Yohanan, Malachi, Elam, Ezer. I guess they ran out of original names. They just kept repeating. The choir sang under the direction of Jezariah. And on that day, they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because, because God had given them, what? Great joy. The women and children also, what? Rejoice. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard from afar off. Verse 44. At that time, men were appointed to be in charge of the storerooms for the contributions, first fruits and the tithes from the fields around the towns they were bringing in the storerooms. The portions required by the law for the priests and the Levites for Judah was pleased. With the ministering priests and Levites, they performed the service for their God and the service of purification, as did also the singers and gatekeepers, according to the commands of David and his son Solomon. Verse 48, 46. For long ago, in the days of David and Asaph, there had been directors for the singers and the songs of praise and thanksgiving to God, so in the days of Zerubbabel and of Nehemiah, all Israel contributed daily portions for the singers, the gatekeepers. They also set aside the portion for other Levites, and the Levites set aside the portion for the descendants of Aaron. Woo! God bless the reading of a lot of his word. Point number one, worship is an honor, yet also a command. Because worshiping God is an honor. It's a privilege indeed for sure. In fact, worship begins with honor. But it's more than that. It is expected and it is required. Some may say, well, I'm not a good singer. It's not my thing. That's not the point if you can sing. My wife knows. I sing around the house a lot and she wishes I wouldn't. 
Worship is not limited to a song. As you have read in Nehemiah together with me, there's a lot of people involved in a lot of different things. Worship is our lives. Worship can be our work daily when we go, nine to five, giving God glory and honor and praise for a dedicated life towards that occupation, that career that we may have. Worship is about how we raise our kids. Worship is about how we honor the Lord with our tithes, with our offerings. Worship is more than just a song. It's our lives. Sacrifice, our attitudes, our relationships, our lifestyles. Matthew 15, 8 says, These people draw to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Watch then where that came from. Matthew wrote from Isaiah 29, 13, Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught, watch this, by the commandment of man. That's not good. Their hearts were far from them. And their worship. There's a lot of people who are worshiping the Lord and their heart is not in it. Because it's more than singing. It's more than moving our mouths to the melody. It's more than aligning our lips to the lyrics. No matter the words that are being sung, if the heart is not engaged, it's only a nice little ditty. Pretty little song. Not that man can demand it either of any of us to worship God because God surely deserves our worship and our praise. And it's our will surrendered to his desire that we be a worshiping people. Amen. We are clearly commanded to worship God. Oh my goodness, Psalm 95. This is so good. I'm going to read it to you. It proclaims, oh come, let us. Everybody say us. Here's the community. Oh come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Worship is primarily a relationship with God, but it's also a community together in relationship with God. Worship is desired and demanded by the Lord, especially for believers in Jesus Christ, those who have committed their lives to Christ, knowing that Jesus died for them on the cross, and you've committed your way to following the way of Jesus. It is something that God puts in your heart that you are called to be a worshiper. It's an expected way of life. Would you agree with me? Furthermore, we are taught to worship no other God and no idol. So easy for idols to slip into our lives. Other distractions, things where we give energy and time and commitment to. Exodus 34, 14 clearly states, For you shall worship no other little G God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, capital J, Jealous, is a jealous God. Deuteronomy 12, 31 adds that those who follow the Lord must worship according to his ways. Not the ways of those who worship other gods. Because then it says, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way as you would an idol. As you can see, there's going to be a lot of scripture in this series, and I'm so excited. Next point, then, is obvious. Worship is biblically prescribed. It also culturally applied. Culturally applied. By the way, my opinion does not matter here today. My opinion does not matter, and for that fact, neither does yours. So we test all things by the word of God. As we walk through these teachings, you'll see me reference the word culture from time to time, and I'll explain that as we go forward. But let me define what the Bible dictionary says about culture, and we'll throw it on the screen so you can see it. Culture, culture, the word is found only in the Septuagint. That specific word. It's translated elsewhere, other words in the Bible, but in 2 Esdras 8 6. By the way, it almost made it in the Bible. It's really close, got voted out. Slim margin, didn't make it. But it's Esdras 8 6 in the King James and the Revised Version. Actually made it there one day. And then I said, I don't know, that's confusing. Let's move on. And it says, Give culture to our understanding. So it's a prayer. God, give culture to our understanding of who you are. So there is a culture that God wants to have. And it said, goes on to say, to nourish it as seed in the ground. And I love this definition. This is where we get the words agriculture and horticulture. Culture is the ground in which things germinate, grow, and flourish. Isn't that a great definition? Love it. And we'll see many references in the Bible 
to worship in the culture of the day. The word of God is illustrated as seed. In the parable of the seed and the sower and other places, the word of God is looked upon as seed in our lives in many biblical stories. And thereby the seed of worship also needs the soil of our understanding to grow. How many people know we can grow in our area, in the area of worship? We should. When you got saved right away, you knew everything about worship? I don't think so. So white flag is a path to tend the soil of our souls to prepare a surrendered heart to understand all that God has for us. We're going to cultivate the garden of our lives. How many people like that reference? Many ethnic cultures have various ways to express their identities. Maybe you come from a culture that has lots of festivals. Setting aside, obviously, the, the culture of the fallen world, the ways of the world, we're not talking about the worldly ways that are inspired by Satan and evil. We're not talking about the things of the world. We're talking about natural, national, cultural identities. We recognize the unique beauty and the traditions that some have. Many cultural expressions. Food comes to mind. Clothing comes to mind. Festivals. Music. Culture brings about all these things. Have you ever been to Israel before? Anybody ever been to Israel before? Sonia, I want to go to Israel. We want to... If you've been to Israel, then you get immersed in the culture and you identify with the sights and the sounds and the smells and the unique feeling you receive when you're immersed in that Hebrew culture. You will see its beauty. Being raised Dutch, forgive me if that offends you, we too experience unique things. We had Gouda cheese and we had good chocolate. Now the Belgians would argue me with me on that one, but we had good chocolate and we had wooden clumpen. Wooden shoes, right? Do you know why Dutch people wear wooden shoes? To keep the woodpeckers off their head. We had our unique culture. Hup, hup, Holland, they're going to win the World Cup. That's another story. Got to cheer for Canada and Holland. That's going to be hard. But what about the culture of the kingdom? Does the kingdom have its own culture? You know we are a holy nation, right? But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. I want to throw this on the screen. Look at this scripture in 1 Peter 2.9. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Why? That you may declare the praises. Say that with me. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So the culture of the kingdom is filled with praise. Calls us to praise. The kingdom has a culture and worship is central to it. We have a sound, and we have celebrations, and we have ice cream. We have a whole bunch of wonderful things in the kingdom. And I think Sunday morning should be an expression of the kingdom. It should be more like a celebration and less like a solemn assembly. Yes, there's seriousness, but can I tell you, there should be marked joy in every time we gather as people of God. Gratitude for his great salvation. Woo! Romans 14, 17 says this. The kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, which a lot of us think that's what church is all about. Not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. We have that on the screen, Andy? You want to throw that? Right? We don't have one? All right. The kingdom of God is. So in Romans 14, 17, it's very specific. It is something. It is righteousness, peace, and joy. That's a beautiful thing in the Holy Spirit. You want to demonstrate the kingdom of God? You want to demonstrate what the kingdom of God looks like and what the kingdom of God sounds like? Now, I did a whole series on the kingdom of God, and I believe that was foundational for where we are as a church. But look at this next thought. Worship is the fuel, yet also the focus of our mission. We get excited about gathering and worshiping and connecting together, and it fuels us, it, in, it informs us, it fills us, but also it focuses us on the great call that we have, the great mission that we have. So just so that I'm clear, the Great Commission is the church's mission, always will be. We don't have any other mission than the Great Commission, to go into all the world, to go, Matthew 28, go, preach, disciple, teach, obey, with the ultimate goal of what? Making witnesses? Making disciples? Yes, that's the step of the process. But the ultimate goal is when you get to heaven, guess what? You're not going to need to witness anymore, correct? What are we going to do in heaven 
that we get the taste here on earth. And everything else is not necessary anymore. We get to worship. So basically, our discipleship is to create worshipers so that one day we all celebrate together. I heard somebody say, don't worry about what denomination you're from because when you get to heaven, we're all united. I went, what? That's not a good joke. <laughs> For Canadians, no. That doesn't seem right. Glad you're laughing. Presbyterians with snarled, so glad you're not Presbyterians today. Even the Baptists are smiling right now. This is, man, this is good. When you arrive in heaven, imagine this scene. When I get through that pearly gates, I really don't care about the gates. Like, they're going to be amazing. But when I get into heaven, it's going to, the sound is going to knock me out. Because you're going to hear the angels and the elders and the saints. What are they going to be singing? Holy, 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 thrice holy. Whenever you see the Bible and it says, verily, verily, it's Jesus raising his voice because you can't put, like, amplification marks in written words. So Jesus, verily, verily, he raised his voice to make sure he said, or truly, truly, but when something is amped up really loud, holy, 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 heaven's going to be loud. So get ready for all the peoples to declare the holiness of God. Oh, come on, how many people are ready for that day? You say, I don't know, what are we going to do? Float on the crowd? clouds with cheery bums and playing, you know, our little harps. Cheerabim, sorry. <laughs> I don't know if I want to go to heaven. No, there'll be no cheery bums on those clouds. <laughs> other than yours, maybe. I'm not sure. <laughs> Worship, next point. Worship involves those inside the church. It also affects those outside the church. When you worship on earth, that refueling, like I was talking about, you're plugging in. We're, we're going electric. We're plugging in to heaven's current. And we're being refueled so that we can be focused to fulfill our mission. But then we look at here, worship involves those inside the church. It also affects those outside the church. You have no idea how powerful your worship is in the Great Commission. The testimony of a worshiping people like, there's not a lot of places around the world people just gather and, like, sing every week. Right? At the Legion? Uh, no. At the Blue Jays? Okay. Blue Jays. But how many often do you go to a Jays game? Well, some of you, like, every week, but that's another story. <laughs> the church gathers to sing praises to a king. There's nothing like it on the planet. It's a beautiful thing. Imagine an empowered church filled with the Holy Spirit, fired up to declare the praises of God, gathering together because our testimony is not lost on the world, church. The lost and dying world that's around us is looking at how we respond to God. Is he good? Is he great? Is he magnificent? Because I'll tell you, the gospel still means good news. Do we have good news as we're declaring his praise? Because worship is personal, yet also public. I'm going to pause on that thought, because I want, to, I want you to hear my heart here. Your worship needs to be personalized, but it's also public. Not, no offense to anybody when I make this next statement. Bear with me on this thought. I'm worshiping in my heart. Good. You're halfway there. Some of you are so happy in the Lord, you need to tell your face. <laughs> Maybe you open your mouth and say, God is good. Maybe once in a while, hallelujah. Listen, I don't have anything to offer the king. There's nothing that he needs from me other than I have from my heart, a hallelujah. He deserves our hallelujahs. He's worthy of our hallelujahs. I'm not fit for his presence. And yet, he ushers me in. And my heart's going to sing. Hallelujah! When I get through the pearly gates, I'm going to go, I made it! And in the meantime, I'm getting my... My hallelujah is ready for heaven by declaring them here on this earth. 
Glory to God. So when we gather together, point A in your notes here, when we gather together for worship, predominantly the worship occurs on Sunday mornings, but gatherings of every gathering, small group meetings, there should be moments where you're reflecting and, and giving God praise. Women's fellowship and honoring the Lord. Youth meetings. I like the definition of worship. Gladly reflecting back to God the radiance of his worth. Find ways to express that. True worship is not coerced. It's not mere ritual of obligation. It's the action of a surrendered and redeemed heart towards one who is worthy. Psalm 40, verse 16. Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let such as love your salvation say continually, say this with me, the Lord be magnified. So that brings us to our next point. We magnify the glory of God. That's our great purpose here. Which brings me to another question. The glory of God. What does that actually mean, we magnify the glory? What is the glory of God? I venture this, got some insight from John Piper. He wrote some amazing things about this. And let me just riff a few things from his thoughts, condensed. And he says, the glory of God is his greatness, his beauty, and his worth on display. Remember what the angels cried out in Isaiah 6, verse 2 and 3. As they flew in the presence of God, each had six wings. With two, they covered their face. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. And one called to another. They called out to each other. Listen to me, church. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Why didn't it say the whole earth is filled with his holiness? My suggestion is that the holiness of God is his intrinsic worth and beauty and greatness, the transcendent greatness and beauty and worth that he himself, apart from any other revelation or creation, is on display. But when greatness and beauty and worth shine forth in revelation to the people of God, to the world around us, to know and admire and enjoy, that's when it's called glory. Hebrews 1 verse 3 speaks of the radiance of the glory of God. Glory has radiance. It's bright. You ever driving on the road at sunset and your visor and you don't really work and you're kind of driving like this because the sun is so bright? The radiance is greater than the sun. His glory is greater than the brightness of the sun. Psalm 19, verse 1, talks about moving out God's, God's greatness and radiance to the universe. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, his greatness, his beauty, his worth. So corporate worship then, as we talk about this, corporate worship is public declaration. Here's the point. Public declaration of who God is, and corporate worship is public thanksgiving for all God has done. I added the word corporate there because there's a difference between personal worship and corporate worship. Nehemiah verse 1, chapter 1, verse 8 says, so with his associates was in charge of the songs of thanksgiving. Again, declaration and thanksgiving if you're writing notes. Number two, we rejoice as the people of God. So we magnify the glory of the Lord and we rejoice as the people of God. Psalm 99 verse 1, 2 says, We will praise you, O Lord, with our whole heart. We will tell all your marvelous works. We will be glad and rejoice in you. We will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Almost everyone would agree that true worship involves outward activity. I'm not going to have any arguments there. Worship is an act. The word itself carries the idea. In the, in the Hebrew, it talks about a bowing down before a great and mighty king. And in the Greek, says even the kissing of the hand, you know, I'm not sure how you do that, but you know, the kissing of the hand of reverence and awe. Like when you meet the king. And some of you go meet King Charles. I don't know if you're going to kiss his hand or not, but you're going to, what do you do that thing? Come on, royal people, help me. You, what, bow? You, geno, what do you, you don't genuflect. You, you curtsy, ladies, right? What are you doing? You're setting yourself up to recognize the authority, the power. True? And you are honoring that moment. Worship is the very same thing. You are bowing in reverence, in awe of the glory of God. It's a powerful thing. 
Almost everyone would agree upon that. And we truly can only rejoice together as God reveals himself to us. In community, God reveals himself to us different ways, more, more different than some of us are comfortable with even. You ever seen somebody just so filled with the love of Jesus, they just bubble? And you're afraid to get close to them because you might get wet? Because <laughs> they're just exuberating. A fountain of joy. We can only truly rejoice together as community as God reveals it. Jesus makes it clear to us in John chapter 4, verse 24, that God is spirit, that, that worship is a spiritual activity, and those who worship him must worship it in spirit and in truth. Not, sep- not just truth and not just spirit. Spirit and truth merge. And that's the beauty. No matter what the act, the heart, the spirit must be engaged. Like we read earlier in Matthew chapter 15, But their heart is far from me, and and in vain they worship me. Since our heart, which is our soul, our, our knowledge, our will, our emotion, are all elements of the heart, the mind, will, and emotions, true worship is therefore not accidental. It has purpose. It's not subconscious. It's not under the radar. And it's not ritualistic. Mind, will, and emotions need to be engaged. Your heart needs to be engaged in worship. So Nehemiah, which we read earlier, let me pull a verse there, verse 43. Many sacrifices were offered on that joyous day. For God had given the people cause for what? Great joy. The women and the children, let me pause there. The women and the children, not just the men, the generations, and the genders gathered together to worship God. Now that's a strong rebuke against religion. Who likes to separate the genders and separate the generations. But the women and children also participate in the celebration and the joy of all the people, the people of Jerusalem, could be heard far away. You know what's going to mark the church in 2022 is joy. What's going to mark Bethany? It's like, man, those are happy people. They love God. You can tell when you hang around with them. Their worship is filled with celebration. Now let me go to the next thought, and some of you are waiting for this. You saw this in your own and say, oh, I can't wait for this. Two problems in contemporary worship. Now you don't have to search very far to see that there are many critics of modern worship music, and I am going to actually affirm some of the critique because it's true. There's some songs that are light on theology. Yeah. Some are stale because they feel like they're the same thing. Yeah, that happens. Their song keys are unsingable. The melodies are not memorable. Yeah, you know what? That's true sometimes. And on and on. And I get it, and I tend to agree for the most part. But there are bigger problems in contemporary worship that I want to address. What? Aren't those big enough? Actually, you can overcome those. I'm not sure you can overcome these two. I think many here today are really curious to know what I think about it. Almost everywhere in the world right now, contemporary worship music is filling churches in high Anglican, Catholic, Lutheran. They're experimenting. They're trying to reach the next generation. They're trying to find a way to bridge liturgy and the language of a generation that's far from them. Every continent, worship has been brought to a place to be understood by the peoples, to be embraced by the peoples. Almost everywhere in the world right now, contemporary music is in church worship services But whether or not the ethos generally associated with these modern hymns on a Sunday morning can sustain the gravitas of the glory of God over the long haul is still to be determined, still needs to be seen. But it is possible that there are contemporary worship songs that draw my heart into the bigness of God, and there are. We sang one this morning. draws my heart in a marvelous way to see the majesty of God described in this book that we've read from this morning. But the goal is not to have a touchy-feely experience, but a time dedicated 
to the awe of God. So let me outline the two problems that I see that we are endeavoring to avoid here at Bethany. Those of you online, hopefully we're going to get you some books. Just ask for these books so you can follow along. And we'll give you the cheat sheet for the ones that you might have missed. For those of you who are not here in the following weeks, just keep your book and then join us. We'll help you fill in these thoughts. But I want you to write down, number one, the self-focused attitude. I think that the problem with modern worship songs really is about a heart that's not fully settled. We wrap it up in fancy language and convincing arguments, but I've seen way too many young people, particularly, who focus on feelings that eventually lose their faith and walk away. It becomes very self-conscious, and I'm concerned about that as a pastor. And I think if only they had captured what the true heart of worship is, and the next song that we will sing at the end of the service, listen to me, church, captures what I'm saying here. The true essence of worship is from the heart. And many that have walked away looking for feelings, and how many people know feelings are fickle? How many people, you feel great, you feel lousy, in the same minute. Feelings are not the way to gauge if a worship song has impact or not. But I believe that many that have walked away are really truly searching for peace and joy and answers that their souls are longing for, but they didn't hang around enough to see that. Lord, have mercy. But here's what it is. It's about gratitude and surrender. Thankfulness for how blessed we really are and how blessed we are in surrender even to the great mysteries of the Word and great mysteries of the Spirit. We just surrender. God, you are mighty. You are a higher than I can ever imagine. Your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. And I'm going to surrender to the fact that there's going to be a whole bunch of mystery in my worship. We're singing songs. What does that mean? I don't know. It's in the Bible. But it must be awesome. So I will sing, even though I don't always understand. But eventually our understanding catches up. I think the serenity of prayer cries out, we need the wisdom to know the difference between what we can and can't control in life. And a worshiping heart teaches one to find and live through the difference with great strength. When you don't feel like going to church, that's the Sunday you need to be in church. When you don't feel like worshiping or singing songs, that's the Sunday you need to sing. I got to tell you about a friend named Paul Follett, pastor in Bancroft Pentecostal Church. He was pastor with me at Evangel. He was the young adult, so I was the youth guy. And we usually sat, we had to sit on the front row, suit and tie, every Sunday. It was the rule. Can you imagine me, suit and tie, every Sunday? Some of you go, amen, pastor, preach it. <laughs> okay. So one time, Paul was in so much pain from a sporting activity, sit beside me, he's complaining, and the worship started. And God told him to dance in his healing. And it was a mellow song. Hallelujah. Something like that. Really mellow. And he's up front. Everybody else is just reflecting. And he's doing a crazy dance. I'm like, oh, he's really lost it. And then he falls to his knees weeping because the presence of the Lord began to restore him in that moment because he obeyed. He surrendered even to the embarrassment of what others may have thought of him. And great songs can do that for us. And he danced in his healing. And he was healed and delivered. And I love the stories and lyrics of some of the songs that I hear. Uh, my, my confessions of my heart. There are pillars in my heart. Some tremendous worship songs that have resonated with me all my life. The anthems of praise that I carry with me throughout the generation. Because I've had an experience with that song. And I take it with me. And you go, oh man, that's an old song. Yeah, it's really old. There's one song that I love, Be Thou My Vision. I wasn't around when that song got written because it was written in 400 AD. I don't think anybody else was here around then. No. I actually love some of the oldies. But Be Thou My Vision was rebuked by the church because it was about self. It was too self-focused. It was about Be Thou My Vision. You can't sing a song about your vision. How many people love that song? 
It's powerful. A bunch of Irish young people wrote that song. And the English didn't like it too much. I won't go there today. It was a modern day rock song. Be Thou My Vision was a rock song. In that generation, they didn't have rock music. It was a folk song that had cymbals and tambourines and you know me. You ever watch Braveheart? That kind of thing. Wow. That was a modern song that got rebuked by the church. Let's give a little grace for the modern hymns because maybe some of them will become classics like Be Thou My Vision. So we have a little breathing room, a little sigh of relief. Okay. But we don't want to be self-focused. Number two is the entertainment approach. This isn't exactly a new concept, having been held over from the 19th century in a revival form where a large percentage of songs found their ways into the hymnals that we actually have in our pews today. They were written for the time. Some were borrowed from the tavern and folk melodies of the day and Bible verses were added to songs from the bar, the pubs. They were resisted by the church of that day and were tended to get people to find Jesus, which was noble. Some modern hymns are now tasked with enticing people not just to Jesus, but to come to church, and worse, that it becomes commercially viable. And so entertainment industry possesses much of modern music. And that entertainment spirit has to be resisted. I went to a church with a friend of mine, guitar player. You know Sean Small. Uh, Sean, friend of mine. We went to this church. He brought us there. He says, you've got to go to this church. This church is very different. I went, awesome. And the, so the service was 55 minutes, way beyond what we've done today. Oh, my goodness. I've got to hurry up here. And the song they sang was, Jesus is my favorite hamburger. <laughs> you can have him with cheese. And I thought the whole song was cheese, but that was another... It was, it was terrible because the theme of the series was fast food Jesus and they wrote a song Jesus my favorite hamburger I thought it was blasphemy to be honest with you I hated that experience I don't care how secret sensitive you want to be Jesus is not your homeboy he's not your hamburger he's the Lord but scripture does encourage us to sing new songs because that's something powerful happens when we keep move keeps us moving forward it opens us to new theology that we've never considered before. So here's the third point, C. And I'll just fly through this, and you're going, oh, good. The point of corporate worship, then, is this. The word corporate comes from the word corpus, which means body, which means this is the life of the body. Life that heart beats, blood flows, is alive. We want to be alive. We want the blood to flow. Hallelujah, Bethany. Amen. We want our hearts to beat. Gathering, the word corpus also means the gathering of common unity. Isn't that interesting? Com where we get the word community? Common unity, where things are gathered. Books are gathered, things are, common unity brings together. I think that's powerful. You may have noticed in this message, there's a lot of we's. The we factor is everywhere. People of Israel in Nehemiah's day were certainly well aware of the grand plan of God. Nehemiah 12, verse 23, it talks about the book of history. We didn't read that, but the book of history, where all the lists were the multi-ethnic, multi-generational, more than ages mixed together, multi-generational, multicultural, multi-class, from various villages of eco-socionomic differences, both rural and urban, multi-expressions were recorded. Lists of singers and dancers and craftsmen and musicians. Nehemiah takes great detail to explain there's a lot of people involved in worship. Number one, why? We encourage each other. Have we gathered together today to encourage one another? I pray. That's primarily the role of leaders, but it's also in Hebrews 10, verse 24, 25. Let's now consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of son, but encouraging one another and all the more as you say, see the day, the day, capital day, approaching. Let us, the role of communities, to stir up, not to scare off, to encourage one another. Next thing is we demonstrate our unity. Nehemiah 12, verse 8 and 9, earlier in that text, who with his associates were in charge with songs of thanksgiving. Their associates, Bakuni and Uned, 
stood opposite them during the service. Let me explain why that is so important. They didn't stand in opposition to them. They stand, stood opposite in their position as a demonstration to the people of Israel that they were one together. They stood on that platform facing the worship leader in honor and unity saying, yes, we are in full agreement. It's a powerful story as we see it here to demonstrate our unity. We exhibit continuity with the church throughout history. This is a powerful thing. Our goal is not to preserve history, but to persevere so that we continue to make history. The church has survived more than the former worship wars. Any student of church history is amazed at how the church survived certain eras. Come on now, when they were throwing people in the lions in the Colosseum, how many were like, man, I don't know about this Christianity thing. I don't know. The church survived the lions, the burning at the stake, the persecution, medieval theology, the crusades, go on and on and on. The church went through a lot of crap. And it survived. Why? Because it's Jesus, church. And here we are, an opportunity. What is our historic place in our historical timeline? I really have, no one can really guess where we are right now. But will they look back on history? If Jesus doesn't come back next week. If they look back on history and say, that church in 2022, they got it together to worship the king. Will we exhibit in this age what all the generations have exhibited in the church to this point? Next thing is we engage together in spiritual battle. In worship, there's all kinds of trumpets declaring war, the utterance of God, his authority over all creation, visible and invisible war that is around even the church today with our absolute allegiance to him and no other. And we rehearse the four chapter phases of the gospel of God's creation, humanity's fall into sin, Christ's redemption, and are calling to be agents of renewal and reconciliation in the days. We confess this together, and we do this together for each other. We weep with those who weep. We stand with those who stand. We rejoice with those who rejoice. Look at Paul and Silas. You know the worst, the dumb thing that those guys did? They put Paul and Silas together. Where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst. Should I put them in separate cells? They want to keep them in jail. But they put them together. Why? Because the church only needs two people. And the prison was shaken. And the shackles were dropped because they were what? Praising God in prison, in spiritual warfare. So when we engage, God enables. Next thing is we dedicate ourselves to the service of God. Nehemiah 12, verse 27 talks about the dedication of the wall. Now, where there's true dedication, there will be singing. I think it's important to note here that in chapter 7, the wall was done. Why are they not celebrating or dedicating until chapter 12? Because in 8, 9, and 10, revival came, and the people weren't ready to de be dedicated until the revival spirit of God captured the hearts of people. So worship was obviously a part of that great revival. And then once worship, listen to me, church, once worship was revived, the people were dedicated. It's powerful. And we give our resources for ministry. Nehemiah 12, 47, in the days of Zerubbabel, Nehemiah, all Israel gave portions. They all tithed, they all gave. The Levites, the leaders, the children of Aaron, the assistants, the staff, they gave in worship. I think when it's offering time, we probably need to cheer. We need to give God some hallelujahs. It's offering time. Woo! We want to be those crazy people. Let's celebrate the opportunity to give to our God. And the last thing is we focus our lives for mission. I've hinted at that earlier, so it won't take too much time here. But dead orthodoxy is appealing to no one, not even God. So we need to focus on what's important. Their worship was purposefully joyful. And I'm going to ask the team to come and lead in worship. Their mission was organized. Their mission was purposeful. They gave attention to the details. You read that Nehemiah chapter again. And they even planned for the future continuance of the great mission. And there's a great emphasis here on music, obviously. And here's the bottom line. You write this in your notes. God desires to awaken the body of Christ in worship so that together we might, together, everybody say together. together. 
we might proclaim the glory of Christ to the world.